Grace and peace to you, and welcome to Lake Oswego United Church of Christ on this Monday, Thursday evening. It is really good to have you worshiping with us tonight, wherever you are coming in from online. Know that we are really glad to have you here. My name is Jenny Odd. I'm the pastor here at Lake Oswego UCC, and thank you for joining us for worship on this holy evening when we remember the last hours of Jesus' life. Tonight we gather for a sacred service of communion and tenebrae, a time when we share in that final meal that Jesus had with his disciples, and a time when we hear again the story of Jesus' suffering and death. Every year we hear this story again but every year we hear it anew, depending on what is happening in our world. And this is the first time in any of our lives when we have heard these words in the time of a global pandemic, when suffering and death is real to us in a different way. And so what we remember in this story tonight is a God who meets us in those places, a God who has also experienced suffering, isolation, loneliness, and death, and a God who meets us wherever we are on our journeys. So as we worship tonight, may you know God's spirit is with you. May you sense God's presence with you, even when we are in different places. Uh, may we feel connected in this time and in this space together. We do have a bulletin for this evening's service, which you can download online, uh, but most of it will be included in the video itself. I also would just invite anyone who would like to join us for Easter worship on Sunday morning at 1030. You can also sign in through the link on our homepage, www.loucc.org. Um, tonight is a contemplative service. It's a time when we just center ourselves before God and before each other. And so I invite us to begin with our practice of statio. Will you join me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, meet us on this sacred night as we remember your love, your service, your suffering, and your sacrifice. Help us to hear these words again. Help us to sense your love with us. Help us to continue to live into the ways of love and justice and mercy that you call us to in our lives. Please continue to be with us as we walk through this sacred night and these sacred days. In your name we pray, O Christ. Amen. And now please join us in our opening song. What wondrous love is this?
as we come together this evening, part of what we remember is the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. The last time that they gathered and shared a meal together, and Jesus gave them this ritual of communion that we continue to practice today. So in just a few minutes, we're going to share communion with each other. And so if you have uh, bread of any kind, a uh, bread, cracker, uh, or really any food, or if you have a cup nearby, juice, wine, water, whatever on hand, I invite you to get that and have it near so that we can partake of the bread and the cup together in just a few minutes. When Jesus uh, came together with his disciples on that Thursday night long, long ago. It was for a Passover meal. And Passover is that ancient uh, and still annual Jewish custom of celebrating God's deliverance of the Israelites from slavery and death in Egypt. It's a meal that points to the past and God's deliverance in the Exodus long ago. It also points to God's continued deliverance in the present, deliverance from fears and violence and suffering and pain. And it's also a meal that points toward the hope for deliverance in the future. And so in invoking this meal and beginning communion and our practice of communion with this meal, Jesus himself is pointing to the past and the present and the future, pointing to his own life as a way that we can experience that deliverance, that freedom, that liberation from our own suffering, from death, from whatever it is that binds us in our lives. Jesus gathered for that meal and at the end of it, he took bread and he said that this is my body. And he talked about the giving up of his own body, of his willingness to die at the hands of the Roman guards, to be willing to uphold love and peace and justice and nonviolence all the way till the end of his life. And that's in sharing of that bread, sharing of that body, sharing in his ways of living and being in the world, that we also experience that deliverance and that freedom. Jesus also gave them the cup. He called it the blood of his covenant, the covenant that God had always promised to be with God's people, to never let them go. In ancient times, covenants were sealed with blood. And so in invoking that memory, Jesus is also pointing forward to his own death, the blood that will be shed, a blood that again symbolizes that love and that justice and that nonviolence that Jesus worked for all the way toward the end of his life. Jesus gave his friends this meal as a way to remember him as a way to remember that they would always have his spirit with them, that they would always have his teachings with him, as a way to remember that even when they were um, scared or alone or afraid, that Jesus' spirit would be there to bind them together and that this sacrament would be there uh, to bind them together. And so we remember and practice this sacrament again tonight as a reminder that even in the midst of the fear and the suffering and the very real pain in our world now, that God meets us in it and God is with us and God binds us together as a community and continues to feed us with God's presence reminding us that God will continue to deliver us and that God gives us hope for the future. And so now I invite us to join in a spirit of prayer as we share the Lord's Prayer together, pray the words that Jesus taught us, and then we'll share in communion with each other. So let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. 
Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come now to our time of communion, I invite you to uh, get your bread and your cup. Um, today I have some crackers with me and also uh, a cup of juice. And we remember God's presence with us as we hear the words that Mark uh, gave us as he told about the Last Supper. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, take, this is my body. Then he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So will you join me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, we ask you to pour out your spirit onto this bread and this cup, that as we eat and drink of it tonight, we would remember your presence with us, that we would feed on your love in our hearts by thanksgiving. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to eat of your bread and drink of your cup knowing that it is God who is with us and binds us together. And as we eat and drink, we will also sing this wonderful song, Jesus, Remember Me. Will you join me in a prayer of thanksgiving? Holy One, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food and ask that it nourish us for the journey ahead. We thank you for the way that Jesus lived and for the path of hope, life, and transformation that he has opened for us. As we remember his life and recall his suffering and death, may we be moved into greater understanding of your love and greater mercy toward your world. In your name we pray, amen.
We come now to the portion of our service known as tenebrae, which basically means shadows. It's a time when we hear again the story of Jesus' suffering and death. And we remember the shadows as they lengthen in the world as his light goes out. Tonight we will hear the passion story from the Gospel of Mark with musical interludes in between. And after the last song, our service will close in silence. And so I invite you to be in a spirit of silence and contemplation and prayer in your own home as the service ends. And now I invite you to join me in the call to reflection. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If I say, let the darkness cover me and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you, O God. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Tonight we remember the light of Jesus and the light of his life as he faced his suffering and death. May the Lord bless us as we remember. May God's light shine in our darkness. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. When they had sung the hymn after the meal, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. All of them said the same. Jesus and his disciples went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, Mother, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The human one is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. And with him, there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, scribes, and the elders. 
Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him and at once said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. In this first part of the Passion story, we hear Jesus being deserted by his disciples, by his friends. We hear his three closest disciples falling asleep on him in his moments of greatest need. We hear him lonely and isolated and worried and distressed, asking God to take this cup from me. And we remember that Jesus experienced deep fear, deep pain, deep loneliness. And in the midst of that, he asked for God to help him and to give him the strength that he needed. And so as we think about all that is going on in our world, all that is going on in our lives, I invite you just to reflect yourself. Where are you carrying anguish in your heart this night? And what would it look like to offer up that anguish to God? from Mark chapter 14 verse 53 to 72. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and, but their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another one not made with hands. Even on this point, however, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What it is that they say testifying against you? But Jesus was silent and he did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Finally, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the human one seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, 
Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? At that point, all of them condemned him as deserving death. Some begin to spit on Jesus, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying, Prophecy. Then the gods also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself by the fire, she stared at him and said, You are with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. He then went into the forecourt. At that point, the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, Peter denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders, bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you, you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But at this point, Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. And then, Jesus, then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. Before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. At that point, Peter broke down and wept. In this portion, we hear Jesus, the rabbi brought before the religious leaders. And they ask him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. He claims his identity. The religious leaders turn him away for blasphemy. His own disciple, Peter, denies him. And yet even in the midst of that human failure and human fear and human frailty, Jesus stays his course. All along, he's been asking people, who do you say that I am? And it's a question that Jesus asks us tonight. As we think about who he is for us, as we think about what his life means, what his death means, with all that is happening in our world today, I invite you to think about the question, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say Jesus is?
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led Jesus into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, Come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, 
truly, this man was God's son. We hear of Jesus brought before the Roman authorities, sentenced to a death that was for criminals and rebels. That Jesus was tortured and mocked and hung on a cross to die. In spite of his love and his commitment to justice and mercy and nonviolence, he underwent death by the empire. And in that moment on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A moment that feels like deep emptiness as the sky darkened, as the world fell silent, as the curtain temple was torn in two. And then it was the centurion the one who was in charge of all those who were putting Jesus to death. It was him who who acknowledged truly this was God's son. This is the paradox of faith that just where God seems most absent God is still there because Christ is there. Because Christ's suffering and death was real. And our suffering and our death is real. But God is here with us. We know in our world right now that there is much pain. There is much suffering. But we have a God who knows what that is like. and who promises to be with us. And so as we remember this sacred part of the story, I invite you to consider your own places of suffering, places in the world that are suffering. and to invite you to offer those to God in hope and in longing for the new life that is to come. May God continue to be with you and bless you this night.